Hello, this is Mark from Productive Computing and Productive Computing University. You are about to watch a selected JSON lesson from our free course called JSON Fundamentals for FileMaker Developers. Knowing how to create, parse, and manipulate JSON is essential in order to integrate FileMaker with the world of APIs, Claris Connect, artificial intelligence, and more. In this complete course, we'll cover everything you need to know about JSON from the perspective of a Claris FileMaker Pro developer. We're making this course available for free because we feel it's an important and essential building block for you to understand in order to advance your skills to the next level. And once you learn how to manipulate JSON formatted text, you are that much closer to accomplishing your first API integration in your own FileMaker apps. And like all our other courses at Productive Computing University, this course comes complete with downloadable FileMaker files for you to use and follow along with. These downloadable files are available directly in selected lessons inside the course. There's a link in the description to enroll in this free course called JSON Fundamentals for FileMaker Developers at ProductiveComputingUniversity.com. Okay, now let's dive into the lesson. So in this lesson, we learn what is JSON and why do we need it? So first, what is it? Well, technically speaking, it stands for Java Script Object Notation, and it is a format that comes from the world of JavaScript, but it's not limited to JavaScript. It's truly universal. In fact, I think of this as a universal standard for data exchange. Technically speaking, it's a text document. It is plain text, but it's formatted with characters and symbols which identify and describe that text. It's exclusively for moving data or for holding data. It doesn't provide accommodations for comments or any other advanced code techniques. It's strictly data. That data can be in the form of text strings as well as numerics or numbers. It consists of keys and values grouped into objects and arrays. This will all make sense once you see how it's formatted and understand how it works. Douglas Crawford originally specified the JSON format in the early 2000s. He and Chip Morningstar sent the first JSON message in April 2001. So in the world of computing, if you rewind the clock back to the 40s, this is a relatively new kid on the block when it comes to formats and acceptable standards, and it really has taken off. It is the de facto standard for moving data today, especially when you talk about APIs. Douglas Crawford, who named and promoted the JSON format, says it's pronounced like the name JSON. But somehow, JSON seems to have become more common in the technical community. Crawford said in 2011, there's a lot of argument about how to pronounce that, but I strictly don't care. So JSON grew out of the need for stateless, real-time server-to-browser communication protocol, such as Flash or Java applets, the dominant methods used in the early 2000s. So why are we using JSON today? And what's the big deal? Well, there's a lot of advantages. Number one, it's human-readable. So you could look at a JSON document and simply by reading from top to bottom or inside and out. You'll be able to see the data and the data will be described. So the document itself describes the data. I'll show you an example of what we mean here in just a minute. Of course, it's got to be machine readable. So machines read it just as easily as humans do. And it's very flexible. When we think of transporting data from a FileMaker file to Excel as an example, we think of ourselves as exporting a single table at a time. Let's take a contacts table where we might have first name and last name and company. Those would be three fields in our data exporting to an individual file that we then bring into Excel or the other way around, Excel into FileMaker. But with JSON, you can actually represent the entire database system with all the tables identified, both with their records and their fields in a single file, if you so chose. And that gives you some interesting advantages where if you were working with, let's say, a QuickBooks API, you could send both the invoice and the line items simultaneously in the same file, whereas perhaps in the old days we thought of doing the invoices first and then the line items as two separate imports. So it's flexible in that way. All right, now let's take a look at some actual examples. So I have on the screen here a core CRM FileMaker database, which is a CRM that we've created, and I'm using it as an example. 
I've got two records in the found set. I've got the first record being productive computing, and productive computing has individuals known as individual contacts. We have Adam and we have Mark. So we've got two individual contacts under the company productive computing. Technically speaking, these are stored in two different tables. I have a contacts table here, and then below I have a portal with the additional contacts linked by a relationship. Now, if I were to export this data using the traditional file export records, and let's say I wanted to create a CSV file, and the type would be comma separated, which is not necessarily unusual, I'm going to do this in such a way where I'm representing both of the tables. Here I have the ID contact, the company, and the website. That would be for this main information here. Then over here, I'm doing the additional first name, last name, email, and phone, which would be the information down here, first, last, and phone. Now, as you may be aware, if you've done any kind of data exchange or import and export using a traditional CSV, what ends up happening is that the CSV file will be trying to do double duty, and you'll have gaps in the data. Let's take a look at that now in a program called Sublime Text, which allows me to see the text easily. So as I look across the records here, I can see that the first thing is the ID, so that's ID 1000, that's over here, followed by productive computing, and then I'm using commas and quotes, commas and quotes, because that's the format for CSV. First name, last name, email, and phone. And now look, here's where the first problem begins. In a file that tries to do both tables, I'm going to have blank, 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 then Mark La Rochelle, and so on and so forth. It's kind of clunky. And what happens when you import this into Excel is you have gaps. It doesn't restate the ID. It doesn't restate productive computing. Now, maybe you wouldn't want it to, but maybe you would want it to. This is where it gets a little awkward. So then what happens in Excel is that you are inclined to fill in this data so that you have an ID for every name, not just the first main name. Same with Double B Foods. Here we have the main company here. 1015, Double B Foods, the email, and then we have the first individual contact here. Then we have the second individual contact with blanks, and the third individual contact with blanks. So as I look at this, yes, I can read it now, but how easy would it be to read if I had thousands of contacts to go through, or if I had more fields here where they're all sort of bundled and jum jumbled together, this was a real simple export. We just had first, last company and so forth. But some exports get really complex with 30 or 40 or 50 fields that you're exporting. And then you combine the idea that you're doing multiple tables and it becomes almost impossible to work with or not as easy. All right, let's look at the same exact data formatted as JSON text. So here it is. Now, yes, there are more symbols to consider. But look how beautifully it's formatted where you have indents and you can sort of see this tree aspect of it. Here we have our first key, which is companies. This sort of defines the entire document. Then followed by companies, we see we have additional contacts and then neatly tucked under that, we have both individual contacts. We have Adam and we have Mark. And the names of the fields, known as the keys, are to the left of the data or the values in each case. So no matter where you are in the document, you don't have to look up to see the labels or go to the first record to see the labels. The labels are continuously displayed throughout the data. This is what I consider self-describing. Then below the additional contacts, we actually have the company ID and the website. Now you might be asking yourself, why is the company below additional contacts? The reason for that is simply because of alphabetical sort order. A in additional contacts comes before C, which comes before I, which comes before W. But it doesn't matter to the receiving computer in terms of how it's sorted. What matters is the actual label or the key. So that's our first set of records. And then our second set of records is here, also relabeled, additional contacts. Then we have contact one, contact two, and contact three. Very easy to see. Another advantage of JSON is that because it's formatted this way, when you put it in a program like Sublime Text, which is a program that does a good job of reading text documents, it allows you to collapse or expand just like this, using these triangles. 
So if I want to not look at the first record, if I want to hide the first set of records, now this is the second set known as the double B foods set. I can hide that just as easily. So you get all of these neat formatting options within the data because it's formatted as JSON. So now we've got the basics. We know what JSON is. We know why it's important, why it's used, how it looks. In the next lessons, we'll learn how to construct it and some of the rules of the road. Thanks for joining us on this lesson. To enroll in the free complete course, click on the link in the description or visit ProductiveComputingUniversity.com where you'll find both free and paid courses on today's most important topics related to the Claris FileMaker platform.